what's in a name? That's the old saying. We know that there is much in a name. Not only people, but other things as well. Actually, every Sunday, Mass has a name. Every Mass does. Normally, it's the first word of the uh, entrance antiphon in Latin. It was more common to refer to Masses this way in the past. Now it's limited mainly to two Masses, one which we celebrated two weeks ago, Laetare Sunday, and also in Advent there's Gaudete Sunday, those Sundays that bring in the theme of joy as we're getting toward about halfway or a little over halfway through those seasons, preparing for a great celebration, a great mystery of the faith, meaning rejoice. This Sunday also has a name. Actually, it has two names. This makes it a little different. But what really makes it different is that neither name is derived in this way. And the two names of this Sunday correspond to the other unique thing about Palm Sunday, and that it is the only Sunday liturgy with two gospel readings, each of which corresponds to one of these two names. We know this Sunday most commonly as Palm Sunday because of the gospel we heard proclaimed uh, before we pro processed in to the church. Our Lord's triumphant entry into Jerusalem when people sang Hosanna to the son of David and greeted him with branches, with palm branches. Hosanna to the son of David is the title of a king. The king God was to send would be a descendant of David, the greatest king of the ancient people of Israel. Our Lord is given this title and greeted with palm branches, an ancient sign of victory, of triumph, of welcoming re the return of a conqueror in war, or welcoming the king of a nation. Yet we know what happens later, and that is the gospel reading for the Mass proper, which is where this Sunday derives its other name, Passion Sunday. We just heard proclaimed the account of our Lord's passion and death. This Sunday brings out to us how fickle human nature really is. Not long after they acclaim him as their king, the people turn on him and call for his crucifixion and instead give their loyalty to Caesar as their king. This is the abasement of Jesus, he who freely lowered himself in order that he might raise us up. This is reflected in the ancient Christian hymn that is quoted by St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians that is our second reading for Mass today. Our Lord's lowering himself, first of all in his incarnation, he lowered himself by coming down from heaven to become one of us, taking on human flesh, emptying himself of his claim to divinity. As St. Paul says, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. He took the form of a slave coming in human likeness. And then all the more so lowering himself in his passion, humbling himself, as he says, becoming obedient to the point of death. And then the greatest humiliation of all, even death of a cross. The death on a cross, the death of a criminal although he was innocent, the greatest humiliation of all. This lowering of Jesus shows itself in so many ways. Even the way he entered Jerusalem on a donkey, not on a horse. One would think if he's entering as a king, he would enter on a horse, a horse that is strong, mighty, powerful, sleek, and fast. It's the animal used in war, an animal fit for a king. It is all the more ironic then that the people acclaim him as their king when he is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, a beast of burden, as the gospel says. A donkey cannot move fast. It is the animal of poor people. I suppose if we wanted to make a comparison to our own time, it would be like entering into the scene in a Rolls Royce versus in an old beat-up jalopy. 
We see this plan developing, though, all along. All their signs are there when we go back to God's people of old. It was all foreordained. St. Matthew points this out in how Jesus fulfills prophecies from the Old Testament. As he says in that uh, opening gospel reading, say to daughter Zion, quoting from Isaiah, then quoting from the prophet Zechariah, behold, your king comes to you meek and riding on an ass on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Then he also quotes Jeremiah in his account of the passion what the Jewish leaders did with those 30 pieces of of silver that they paid it out for the potter's field, just as the Lord had commanded me. Quoting from Isaiah, uh, from Zechariah, Jesus himself says in his response during his his, uh, interrogation that it must all come to pass as scripture has foretold. He fulfills the prophecies of the suffering servant psalms in the book of the prophet Isaiah, one of which we heard in our first reading. There are four of these suffering servant psalms that mysteriously give us a foreshadowing of the Messiah in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There are four occurrences. The first one is the calling of this suffering servant and then the opposition he faces, and then the reading today, which tells of how he is bitterly reviled. And then the fourth one is that how his mission consists in what he preaches as well as in what he endures. Bringing those two aspects together, what he endured and what he taught, sets the pattern for us. His self-emptying, his his humility, actually his ultimate humiliation sets the pattern for us because it doesn't end there. As that great Christian hymn that St. Paul quotes in his letter to the Philippians concludes, because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And in fact, it is from this ancient hymn where we have our custom even up to today of bowing the head at the name of Jesus as it concludes that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the pattern. Being brought low is the only way to glory. The only way is embracing the cross as he did, not fleeing from it. This fleeing from the cross, I believe, explains why there is so much going wrong in the world today. People flee the cross in so many ways. They cannot accept it, whether that is not accepting the created order for the way it is, but rather attempting to redesign it to fit one's own fancy. And I say attempt to. We cannot redesign the created order. If we try to, it only will redound to our own harm. Or if it means not accepting the consequences for one's actions, but demanding to be absolved from such actions without making amends or even admitting that one is wrong. How difficult it is to hear someone apologize nowadays. They might go so far as to say they regret that it happened, but to apologize and say, I am sorry, I apologize for what I did. Very often instead, it gets to the point of blaming someone else for one's own wrong actions. This is all avoiding the cross. But ultimately, there is no avoiding of the cross. We can try to escape it as long as we are in this world, but we all eventually will have to die. Every single one of us, sooner or later, will face the ultimate humiliation of death. Embracing the cross is how we prepare ourselves for that self-emptying. We hear in the Passion account the contrast between Peter and Judas. Judas could not prepare himself that way by repentance. Peter did. He wept bitterly when he realized that the Lord was right, that he betrayed him. But he repented and went on to be the foundation stone of the College of Apostles and imitate his Lord in his own death, giving his life for him. We embrace the cross, preparing ourselves 
for the ultimate humiliation of death by imitating our Lord's self-emptying. We empty ourselves in humility, in love of God, toward love of others. So when that moment comes, when we will pass from this life to the next, we will have already been there. We will have already freely lowered ourselves because we have freely lived for God and in accordance with his will. This is what Holy Week is for, to be a reminder of this ultimate spiritual reality and a stimulus to move us to live ever more faithfully in this way, in the way of lowliness, as preparation for the ultimate lowliness of death. And this is precisely the message the Church gives us in starting out this week, as we prayed also in the opening prayer for this Sunday's Mass, the Collect, where we prayed first about the abasement of Christ in His incarnation and ultimately in His humiliating death. Almighty ever-living God, who, as an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Savior to take flesh and submit to the cross. And then the call for us to follow that pattern that he has set in the second half of the prayer, which is already anticipated in the first half where it speaks of him giving an example of humility for the human race to follow. Graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering and so merit a share in his resurrection. This is the only way there. Let us then make good and wise use of these holiest days of the year by our prayer, penance, and participation in the most sacred of liturgies that mark these most sacred of days. For taking ourselves low by embracing the cross is the way to exaltation in God's sight. By living this way, God gives us foretastes in this life of the glory that is to come, the glory that after the ultimate abasement of death is the ultimate exaltation of life in heaven. <laughs>